All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for being here tonight. Uh, we start on time, we end on time. We're going to end at 9 o'clock, but that doesn't mean we're going to run out of here. And that's assuming that hopefully you've come here with enough questions tonight, because in a couple of minutes, you're going to meet our cabinet. And this is, uh, for us, uh, an exercise, if you will, a, a journey of learning. And we're here tonight to learn as much from you as hopefully maybe you will from us. Uh, and there's no holes barred on the questions. We'll talk about the ground rules a little bit, but I would really like to start the evening off with a pule. And we're fortunate enough that Savili Bartley, who's Millie High School's JV volleyball coach, has agreed to do that. So where's Savili? I just saw him a minute ago. He's right here. Okay. Get uh, First off, I want to welcome everyone to Mililani High School. Um, so with that being said, if we could get into pule mode. Okay, e pule kako. E kia koa manaloa. Mahalo nui for bringing everyone here safely. Please bless everyone and please make this space a safe space for everyone to converse and for us to share aloha and be the most pono as we can as we talk about all of the different things that we as Kanaka want to talk about within our home of Hawaii. Give everyone the pono mindset so that we can all work together to make Hawaii better for us. Amen. So let's just talk about a couple of ground rules, okay? Um, what we really like to get from you tonight are questions. And as I said a moment ago, you could ask anything that you want, and that's why we brought our team out here to be sure that you can actually talk to somebody who really can maybe address your problem. But I will say this to you ahead of time. In the spirit of being truthful, you may not like what you hear tonight. I can't guarantee that. Hopefully you will. But we would rather be truthful with you than sit here tonight or come here tonight and tell you something just to make it comfortable in the moment and not have that based in reality. Because much of what we deal with in running the city has to deal with reality. And we accept that each and every day. And coming out like this, and this is our fourth town hall meeting. We started out at Eva Mackay Middle School, then we went to Waianae last week with Phil Kahn with Waipahu, and we came here tonight. I can promise you that we're really excited about coming to Milwaukee. In fact, let me just say something anecdotally. When our kids won the Little League World Championship team that, uh, series this year, and we knew we wanted to throw a big parade, I remember my, 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 probably my only contribution was a lot of people could, I said, we've got to get Milwaukee High School. And this was the first call we made, and they said yes, and not only that, they brought the band and the cheer squad and whatever, but we had a really great day that day. And so I've always had a lot of affection for this community. I know it's a tight-knit community. I've been coming out here since the early 70s, um, and I've watched it grow over 50 years. And so, but you know, we know full well that as good a great and great a community as this is, there are issues, and that's why we're here tonight. So what I'm gonna ask, because I'm gonna be kind of the moderator, uh, is that um, if you get, start getting long-winded on a speech up here, I'm just gonna cut you off and say, what's the question? Because what we'd really like to do tonight is to answer as many questions as we possibly can. What I don't wanna have happen, assuming we're here till 9 p.m., is that there's a, a line of people there. And by the way, you don't have to form a line. You can be patient, come up one at a time. We're not gonna run out of the building. We're here to stay and answer. So I want you to be comfortable in that setting. Is that fair? Okay. Look, I'm extraordinarily proud of the men and women behind me. Uh, I would tell you that in being mayor, uh, it's definitely not a solo challenge. Even though there's a lot that happens, if you will, where the buck stops, and I understand the accountability of my office, couldn't do this job without these people. But they're not just people. There are people who stepped up to the plate during a time when we were all being challenged in ways that most, none of us could have really imagined. And so we put this cabinet together during the months of November and December of 2020, after we were locked down since March with COVID. And when we got sworn in together on January 2nd, 2021, it was very dark and uncertain. And there was a lot of fear and a lot of other things to deal with. Most people weren't talking about a vaccine. The vaccine wasn't gonna be, it was projected maybe the end of 21. So I have such great respect for the men and women behind me because in a very dark hour, many of them left really good jobs and even took pay cuts because this is home. They understood the challenge of the moment 
and they wanted to be part of the solution. And I'm very proud of what we've gotten done in the first two years and three months on the job, but none of us are satisfied on where we are. So we have a long-term commitment on what we hope to get done. It does take time. If any of you saw my State of City speech not too long ago, I said, what I learned about this business, and somebody said this to me, it's not my saying, is that the days are long, but the years are short. Time goes by fast, and we're trying to get as much done as we can across our entire island. So with that, I'm gonna have each one of them in introduce themselves, I'm gonna pass the mic around, and then we'll get going on any questions. I'm gonna say it again, ask us anything. I want you to feel really comfortable. What we want when you go home tonight is we want you to feel like this was a very meaningful experience that you had. That we came, we showed up, we didn't pretend, we didn't talk in political ramble. We, we're going to be straight with you. Fair? All right, good. So we'll start right down here. And I'll let you introduce yourself. We'll pass it down. Right Hello, my Kako, uh, Ernie Lau, Board of Water Supply. Uh, Ola Ikavai. Hi, good evening, everyone. Kat Tashner, Department of Land Management. Thank you for having us tonight. Good evening. Uh, my name is Haku Millis. I'm the director for Department of Design and Construction. Uh, thank you all for being here. Good evening. I'm Roger Babcock. I'm director of the Department of Environmental Services. We take care of wastewater and refuse. Thanks. Aloha. Lloyd Yonenaka, executive secretary for the neighborhood board system. Do we have any neighborhood board members? I just saw that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for being here, but more importantly, thank you for being on the board. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Dawn Sevchek. I'm the director and chief engineer for the Department of Facility Maintenance. Um, I am the child of immigrants, born and raised in Whitmore Village in Waihoa, and my son goes here to Milani High School, so. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Formby, and I'm the managing director. So I have the pleasure of working with the mayor and Krishna, the deputy managing director, with all the men and women up here tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Krishna Jaram. I'm the deputy managing director. Thank you all for being here. Aloha, good evening. My name is Matt Gonzer. I serve as the city's chief resilience officer and the executive director for the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency. My name is Stephen Courtney, Deputy Director for the Department of Information Technology. We provide the computing, storage, network, and communications that's utilized by all the city departments in, in the city. And we also provide applications that um, we provide internally as well as externally to the public. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. I'm Roger Morton. I'm the Director of Transportation Services. That means that we operate the public transportation systems on the island, looking forward to getting rail up and running in about a few months. Uh, and we also design and engineer all the traffic control devices you see on your city streets. Mahalo for coming. Hello, everybody. Keith Orka, I'm a Deputy Chief for HPD. I'm also a Waihawa boy, uh, born and raised, uh, lived on the road in Milani now. Happy to serve my community here. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tate Nojima. I'm the captain of District 2, which includes Wahiwa and Mililani area. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jason Samala. I'm the deputy fire chief for the Home and Fire Department. Thank you for being here. Aloha. My name is Jennifer Walter. I'm the deputy director for the Department of Emergency Management. Thank you. Hello, my Kako, Edward Los Banos. I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Community Services. So we manage most of the human services on behalf of the city and county of Honolulu. Thank you all for coming out. Aloha, good evening. Kim Sparlin, Deputy Director of the Office of Economic Revitalization. See some longtime friends, made some new friends, and look forward to ongoing conversations with you all. Aloha Kako, my name is Denise Seri Matsubara. Today is day seven for me. I'm the new uh, director for the Office of Housing and Homelessness. Thank you all for being here this evening. 
Good evening, everybody. Tracy Kubota, Deputy Director for the Department of Enterprise Services. We have auditoriums with Blazel and the Shell, Holo Zoo, golf courses. Good to see friends, neighbors, family. I'm a Milani um, Malka resident. Thanks for being here, you guys. Hi, good evening. Derek Meischer. I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Customer Services. We take care of driver's license, satellite city halls, and we have a public communication division. Thank you all for coming. Good evening, my name is Ian Santi. I'm the Deputy Director for the Honolulu Emergency Services Department, Oversee working with the ambulances, the lifeguards, our city health services, and our core project. Thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jiro Sumata. I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Planning and Permitting. We take care of issuing building permits and land use development permits. Thank you. Hello, hi everybody. I'm Donna Puna, Director of DPP, Department of Planning and Permitting. Thank you for having us and go Trojans. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's Erwin Kawata. I'm the Deputy Manager at the Board of Water Supply. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bugs Baggio, Assistant Director of Human Resources. If you're an accountant, admin, specialist, planner, plumber, <laughs> mechanic, engineer, please come see me. Um, we'd like to recruit you. Thank you. Aloha nui kako, makanani salat, Executive Director, Office of Culture and the Arts. Hi, aloha ahiahi. My name is Kehau Pu'u. I'm the Deputy Director of the Department of Parks and Recreation with my director, uh, Laura Thielen. We manage and oversee over 300 parks, the city parks, recreation facilities, botanical gardens, and about 250,000 city trees. Mahalo. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carrie Castle. I'm the Deputy Director with Budget and Fiscal Services. I'm honored to be Mayor Blangiardi's representative on the Mililani Malka Neighborhood Board, and I'm happy to see quite a few of you uh, here. So thank you so much. I'm Lori Kahikina, CEO and Executive Director of Heart the Train. We have a few other people that I would like to introduce. I'm going to ask you to stand um, so everybody can see you. First of all, Val Okimoto is here from District 8. Val, council member. Val is new to our council, and, and not only that, with her tonight, Matt Wire from District 2, council member. And state representative, Trish LaChica, who I just saw right here. Thank you, Trish. I, I think we've covered everybody in the audience that way, except for Kylie Akeona. Let me just say something about Kylie real quick. I'm going to have you come up and talk for a second. Um, who else did I miss? Michelle Kadani is here. Oh, Michelle Kadani. That's right. I just saw her. She just gave me a lay. I forgot. What am I thinking? <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a lot of pressure on doing this. There she is. Michelle, thank you. I'm sorry. You know... Uh, uh oh, this is Mike Formby is Mike Formby is our Tom Brady. Here's the quarterback right here. Okay, go ahead. Peruso, Peruso is here. Who? <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that one. But I want to one of the things that we did and I'm really proud of um, is that we decided to stand up a youth commission. It was talked about. Uh, and we have, and we've gotten some really outstanding young people. We're on our second year of it now. And so this young lady, Kylie Akiona, is on it. So I didn't tell her she was going to speak tonight. So it's going to be really impromptu. Maybe about a minute or so, Kylie. Come up and introduce yourself. And we're really proud of Ky Kylie. Um, aloha mai kako. Um, I'm super nervous. So sorry if I talk really fast. Um, but my name is Kylie Akiona. I use Chile pronouns. I'm born and raised in Mililani Malka, also decolonially known as Kipapa. Um, I live right up the street. Also, my brother went to school here, so go Trojans. My dad was a firefighter here. If you know the Akionas, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm so grateful to all of you for being here, especially because this is my community too, born and raised in Mililani. Um, I'm so grateful to this Aina, especially for feeding me and for continuing to grow and raise me, um, especially as a Kanako Oivi. Um, so I'm the youth commissioner for District 8, or Mililani included, and 
basically my role is to kind of advise the city and county of Honolulu, including Mayor Blanche, excuse me, Mayor Blanchiardi and the folks behind me on issues relating to youth and some solutions. So some things that we're working on right now are defueling Red Hill, youth trafficking, um, getting youth decarcerated and uninvolved in the criminal legal system and that kind of stuff. And we hold meetings every third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 until around like 7, 7.30. So please feel free to join us and please feel free to talk story with me as well. I'm super Niele, so I love to hear about everyone and all the things that you care about, especially tonight. Um, and just so you know about me, like I said, I'm a Kanako Oivi. I'm very, very passionate about freeing our lands, waters, and bodies, especially as we're occupied by the US. Um, so mahalo. Thank you, Kylie. All right, one last introduction. I want to apologize to Amy Peruso. Where are you? She's over here. There she is, Amy. My apologies. Didn't see you. All right, so what we want to do is really keep this questions and answers. We're not going to make any presentations tonight. We want to hear from you. So who wants to go first, as they say? Come on. There's the microphone. So all I ask is you can set it up, but Get to your question, okay? Good. Hi, my name is Brenda, and what I'm here about is. Oh, this is good. Oh, it's a little cute. Okay, I'm right next. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I wonder what Barbara wants to talk about. Go ahead. Go. Well, there's the vibrato in my voice is not vibrato, it's nerves. So. Oh, okay. Don't be nervous. What's your first name? Brenda. Brenda. Don't be nervous. Go ahead. Okay. And um, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming and listening to us. It, for me, it means a lot, you know, that you hear our voice and what we have to say to you. And I, I do appreciate that a lot. So what it is, is this is a growing concern in Mililani in our area um, about the trees that we have that have fallen on homes here. And there is a growing concern with Milani residents over the overgrown and unmaintained trees located on the Mehuula Parkway and Lanikuhana Avenue. These trees have outgrown their planted sidewalk areas and their rooting system is causing damage to our common areas. Sidewalks are being lifted, non-intended speed bumps are on our major roadways, and property damage are just to name a few. In the effort to band-aid these problems, the root systems have been cut in their planted areas. However, these solutions have only caused the trees to weaken and cause bigger destruction and do now due to their fragile states, these large trees, some at least 25 feet tall, are encroaching on our property lines, falling on our roadways, our fences, roofs, and even recently renovated homes. Now this section of Mililani, um, a lot of the people that lived there bought it when they were first built, which is 20 something years ago. And they've used, and they're retirees, and they've used their savings to renovate, re-roof, paint, take care of their homes, only to have a tree crash on their roof. And this was just recently. Since November 22, the storms that contain gusts of 40 miles an hour winds uprooted at least seven trees in a small stretch of the Mehuula and Lanikuhana intersection. Since these past storms, homeowners are now afraid to have their children and family, sorry, I'm sorry. That's all right. Sleep in their own rooms, in their homes. All right. The, that front these trees, fearing for the safety of their lives. One can only ma imagine hurricane force winds. What would they do to these trees? So Brenda, that's great context. What is your question? My question is, is that we believe because the trees that have been cut and they have not been maintained or pruned, is that we suggest that they come out and look at these trees and find out the compromised trees and they cut them down. And I'm not anti-tree, I'm, I'm not. But the thing is, is that these trees are doing right. devastation and we're picking up the pieces. So if they cut these trees and then they can concentrate on the healthy trees to prune them and to cut them back to make them more healthy. Because right now they just come through maybe once a year and cut a couple branches and they're gone. And uh, Mayor Blangiardi, this is for you. 
Okay. I made Thank this you. packet for you with Thank pictures you. and everything. So this is okay. for you. Well, Kehau, as you heard I, in her yeah. introduction, I saw, I knows a her. lot about trees. Yeah. Right, yeah. Kehau? Thank you very much, Brenda. Go ahead. Hi, Aloha. Thank you so much for bringing your concern. Thank um, you. So we do come out to, and we will send a team out to come out and assess the trees, do an assessment and evaluate whether they need to be removed. Uh, or if they are healthy enough and they need to, we need to do some better pruning. I, we will also, you know, we will also evaluate the contractors that we have who come out to do our tree trimming. It is the goal of the city, especially given uh, climate change and, and, and heat that we preserve the tree canopy, but when it is, you know, we understand the impact and yeah. the fear. So we will I send you. A, I'll give you my card and okay. we can. Talk That's more. fine. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Well, and Mayor, there's a hundred um, signatures petition of residents that signed for this. You know, uh, to take nothing away from anything you said, this is a problem in a lot of places. Yeah, I know. I know? understand. And um, I, I think we want to stay as sensitive to it as possible. I can tell you in this job, in my two plus years of being in it, just the challenge of fixing the roads and the trees that have ripped up the roads, not mm -hmm. the least of which is the danger. I mean, we were dealing just recently with the boulders coming down right. the side of the mountain mm -hmm. to people's houses. So uh, we will try to get done in earnest what I said earlier tonight about giving you a straight answer. I mean, we, we have some limitations. We're hiring right now. You know what Bug said? He wasn't kidding. <laughs> I'd like to get about 25 of you to become full-time employees before you leave tonight. But we're trying to hire people because these, these are jobs that are just manpower. And so that has something to do with the schedule. When we, and, and so, but you contact Kale. We'll follow up. Thank you for that packet. We'll take it most seriously, Brenda. Thank okay? you. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for you're, hearing me. You all come on up, sir. Thank you, Brenda. Kale. My name is John. On that note, I've been chasing the city and county seven years to fix my sidewalk in front of my house. Two years ago, the 80-year-old neighbor fell, broke her teeth. Lucky we didn't get sued. I told you guys that. You guys came out. You marked the ground with paint. You put asphalt. And for two years, it sat like that. The asphalt is now deteriorating. I was going to look for your office, because I hear talk to the mayor, to send the pictures to. Because there's four sections. It's breaking my wall, too. Okay. But I've been chasing so we did seven that repair years. Within, we, we did that repair within the last two years? Yeah, because a lady fell. Seven years I've been trying to get them to address the okay. sidewalk issue. Okay. And I've been ignored. And then when I called and I said, you better hope the lady doesn't sue, they came out. This is before your time. And fixed some asphalt. And I, they marked the ground with paint, so I thought you guys were going to address it. Okay, but let's be clear here now, just so I hear you correctly. You said this was before we came into office. Yes. They came out and fixed it. Are we even, they didn't fix are it. We even aware right now? Have well, we, is, I've been, I mean, let's, be, let's yeah. be fair with each other. I've okay? been calling whoever I... Yeah, but I got to promise yeah. you, we didn't come into office and say, let's look through all the back okay. records and find out... No, what no, they I knew. called, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. at that point, I thought it, something was going to be done and it all hasn't right. been done. So... Because they marked the ground, they put asphalt, and they said they were coming back, and nobody else. They came never back. did. So we'll get your address, and we'll All get right. that tonight. Does anybody want to say anything about it? We'll just do handle it that way. Don, you want to say anything? Yeah. I only brought it up because of trees. As a tree, as a tree suggestion, I'm not a, into agriculture, <laughs> but I see them do it, and I think, in God, that's our taxpayers' money wasted. They come and they cut the road, yeah, and then they repair the road every three or four or five years. How about planter boxes? If you build a big enough box where there's one or two feet wide, yeah. put it in the ground, plant a new tree, then the roots will stay within that box. In some trees. We, we've learned yeah. a lot. There's been a lot of, we're, as, as Kehau said earlier, we're really very much in favor of trees and tree canopies, but you have to know what you're planting in the ground and what's going to rip up a road and what can survive in a planter's box. Not everything can, yeah. but that's good. So, K right. Don, you want, good. I just want to add, um, you know, we're a lot more akamai now about the types of trees that should or shouldn't be planted along our city streets and medians than we were 30, 40, 50 years ago. So we have expanded our tree inventory for the types of trees that are appropriate yeah. for our neighborhood. So well, I, did I, did, I went through many too. years, MTA, MTA says it's you guys, you guys were saying it's MTA, 
back and forth. No, we're I not mean, saying that tonight. No, no, I'm just, that, yeah. I've been seven yeah, years I, trying to get, just get the right. sidewalk fixed, but the tree's got to go because the sidewalk is breaking. Okay, all so right. Don, what do you idea. want to add to that? What's your yeah. name? John. What's, John. John. Yeah, so I want to get your address Maybe and I'll look in our work okay. order system where that's at, if it's even in there. Okay. Um, and I just want to encourage the public, you know, we have a Honolulu 311 app. I just found that out. Super awesome. the guy outside yeah, the door. so if you use that, you can actually click a request, it geotags yeah. where you're at, and then you can send pictures with that, and it goes straight into our work order system. Oh. So, yeah, by all means, guys, use that if you okay. can. I was gonna do that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, John. Okay, Barbara and her gang sorry, are here <laughs> on Rose. I can't even bring it down, no need. Sorry, no, I'm loud no. enough. You can do it. Yeah, yeah. I know Barbara because Barbara is also a member of HPD. <laughs> She's pulled me over okay. a couple of times, okay. gave me 10 tickets. No, no. Good luck with your request tonight, lady. Okay. No. no. Okay. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. You got jokes, Mayor. Um, hey. Hello. hello, everyone. I'm sorry. Um, first of all, thank you, Mayor, for having this. And also to the cabinet members. Hi, guys. Um, for um, hearing us out. Um, my name is Barbara, as the mayor said. And this is my uh, small group, just a, a little glimpse of... I'm just going to see all the walks of life, different ages, different ethnicities. Um, we come from medical fields, uh, law enforcement, um, teachers, and stay-at-home moms. I'm here because we are roller skaters. During COVID, a lot of us um, needed a, an outlet, and this was it. And I can tell you honestly, none of us knew each other. None of us knew each other before this. And how we met up with each other was we just ran into each other at parks. And that's our problem right now, is that we don't have a safe place for us um, to skate, where we're not gonna get banged by cars. Um, sure, we can park, we can skate on the street, but as a group, we can't do something like that. Um, we've been skating at different areas around the park, but we would like, and also harass, you know, we get chased off a lot by skateboarders because we're in their park because it's for skateboarders only, or we'll get um, chased by tennis courts and people playing tennis. So we're asking, our request is that we have a skating rink here in Hawaii Kai and also in Mililani. And we're just wondering why the park is locked because we'd like to use that. Not surprising. Who wants to take that on up here? <laughs> okay, okay. We actually know, well, you know, one of the things that I failed to do, forgive me for a second, I'm not going to digress, but I did introduce our comms team, which is in the back communications team, and the man standing up there who lives in Media Line, and his wife is here tonight, Scott Humber, is our director hey, of communications. Scott. Scott is also an avid skater, and he plays hockey a couple of nights a week, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And then Ian Schering's here. And he's our deputy, of, and then Brandy Higa's got the camera going. David's back there on sound, and Molly's somewhere here. And just so you know, we're recording this, uh, and we do that because what we want to do is be sure that we have the proper follow-up. I probably should have told you that earlier, and make sure we don't miss any questions, and that all questions, if they're not answered tonight, because some of the questions we know will require follow-up, we want to do that, okay? So let's talk about that. I know where that hockey rink is. It's close to... It starts as yes. Hi, aloha. Thank you, uh, Mahalo, for bringing your concern to us. So right now, um, the, the rink is permitted for practices only. Uh, I'll be honest, we weren't aware of this, so we are working on changing that. We will be permitting for games as well. And I also recently learned that we don't have open rink hours, um, both here and in Hawaii Kai. So we will go back and discuss and try to better understand why that is. Um, in the meantime, though, we are making some improvements next week. Uh, our team will be painting the rink and will be permitting for both games and practices. I also want to offer, you know, I want to come in and talk with you folks, and I see the, the hockey hui over here too, right? Um, just to work with you folks on maybe some kind of adopt, adopt a rink agreement, um, and then also, you know, to hear more from you about... Um, you know, leaving the, the ring open. I will share vandalism is always a concern, um, but we, we want to align with our practices with like our skate parks. So yes, yes I will Barbara, share my card with you, you folks. Let me ask, Barbara, what would be an ideal situation for you? What kind of hours are you talking about? What are you thinking about? Go ahead, Harmony. 
Go ahead, Harmony, take I, it. <laughs> um, bear with me, I have vocal cord issues. We basically want to be able to share the park with the hockey players, with the roller derby girls. We don't want anyone monopolizing on the time. We want to make sure that everybody gets a piece. So what kind of hours, though, would it have to be open that would make so, you feel like... If there was some kind of calendar that could be established, maybe with the, you know, the hockey guys have their designated practice times and okay. maybe we can skate there after, which I think is another point they're going to bring up is if we could have lights because a lot oh. of people get off of work and they want something fun to do with their family or with their kids. So if there were lights, you know, they could have their late afternoon practices and then we could free skate after that. And then I know there's also some roller derby girls that use the park on the weekend. So our main thing is we want to make sure everyone has a time. Okay. How's the, uh, I'm just curious, how's the surface as it currently exists? I just drive by it. I've never really gone and stood in it. You well, know? it's concrete. So yeah, but is it in good shape or is it it's okay, yeah, it's but if you've ever fallen on concrete... Uh, well, what, what would you like to fall on? <laughs> what? 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 I think the hockey guys actually are going to talk hockey about town. that. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. they'll bring that up. Okay, we'll but, look into it. Yeah, well, I think he, the fact that there's a rink out here is a great starter. Right. Yeah. You know, I know yeah, Scott's yeah. talking to me about putting yeah. a roof over it. That's a whole different yeah. thing and probably a different kind of capital project, but lights ought to be something we can achieve. Yeah. Go ahead. The regular time, yeah. Just to, to pinpoint the hours, I think it's kind of like the way we see it as, as roller skaters, it's kind of like skate parks. Skate parks are kind of open. Like I mean, technically speaking, yes, 10 o'clock, the gates, you're not supposed to be on property and whatnot. But, you know, regular hours, yeah. like the skate parks from... Could you live hours. with a 10 p.m. curfew? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I totally okay. could live with that. We All could right. live with that, not me. Right. I mean, we. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you, Bob. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Now, I'm just going to remind you that Scott Humber, who's back there, is not going to let me forget this conversation. That's because he's been, he's been talking to me about this as well. Shireen, right? Yes. Thanks hey, for Shireen. remembering my name. Yeah. So um, I, first of all, just wanted to um, thank you all for taking the time to listen to our concerns and hopefully um, helping with some quick resolutions. I'm a 30-year resident of Mililani and commute to town in traffic every day. You can basically call me a traffic expert. Traffic is horrendous in the morning and in the afternoon time for people that are coming from this side of the island as well as the west side of the island. And we're just trying to make it to work on time. I'm requesting your consideration and help in making some immediate changes to our traffic situation. At this time, our government is creating our own unnecessary traffic backlogs. I'm requesting your help with four changes. Number one, don't schedule the police to give out tickets on the freeway during rush hour from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and in the afternoon time. Yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 Keith, Keith, this has your name written all over it. Okay, this, this, this is gonna be good. Go ahead, all right, yeah, go ahead. And, and don't get me wrong, I have the utmost respect for what the police officers do for our community. It, you know, I, I can't express that enough. It's just the scheduling I think could be um, handled a little bit better. That would make a big difference for the people out here in the community. Um, everyone knows where you're at. We know that you guys are right before Costco. We, 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 know, we know that you're right after the, the zipper lane at the airport. And, and what happens is it causes drivers to slam on their brakes, creating a backlog and sometimes accidents. Last month, I think you guys might have remembered that there was a major accident within the zipper lane. And um, the drivers were desperately using the entrances of the zipper lane to exit against the flow of traffic. Instead of the police officers used, closing the entrances to the lane, they gave out tickets at the end when, they were, when the commuters were finally able to build any type of momentum. So, you know, they're probably super frustrated and they're, and they're getting to the end and, and just trying to like get, get out of this hour or something worth of zipper lane. I, I will tell you that the majority of people that are on the road during this time are just honest, hardworking people who are trying to get to work in time to put food on the table for their families. I'm, I'm one of them. The second request, increase the speed limit to 65 miles an hour during rush hour periods. This will also eliminate the need for police reinforcement on the freeway. Most major cities don't limit their freeways to just 55 miles an hour, and we're a major city. Number three and four, 
There are three lanes uh, from 5.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. dedicated just to carpoolers, leaving less lanes open for single drivers. We are capped out on the number of people who have the ability or option to add a rider in their cars. Please reduce the number of carpool lanes to two, which is the zipper lane. We don't need three dedicated carpool lanes in the morning. In the past years, the hours of the carpool were also increased. My ask is to have the carpool lane hours reduced to two for both the morning and the evening traffic. All right. So Shireen, before Keith gets up here to talk about what HPD can do, and I'm not an expert on speed levels and whatever, but this could be a state slash federal requirement on roads and whatever, but I think there's something like that. And Roger, you may even know about this. This is Roger Morton, who's head of transportation, but he also ran the bus on our islands for over 40 years, so. Well, let me try to, to answer, answer this, and I'll, I'll start with number two, which was uh, increase the speed limit. Unfortunately, we would not increase the speed limit, and it wouldn't help in the traffic congestion even if we did, because there's a density issue with traffic, uh, and that's what's going to control the speed at the rush time. It's not if we made the speed limit faster, what we would have would be uh, we would have more bad accidents, more collisions, uh, and we would not improve the the actual throughput on the roads. Uh, the third one, dedicated carpool lanes, that is a state issue, but it makes good sense to me uh, that we do have, uh, we have three carpool lanes uh, coming in, uh, two of them in the zipper, one on the, uh, uh, on the left side of the regular road. Uh, I can tell you how that probably got, that is a state road, as the mayor said, uh, but I can tell you that the federal highways people uh, have made it easier for state highway departments to add extra capacity if it's a, uh, a high occupancy lane. And this goes back quite a ways, that one. It goes back even before the uh, zipper lane. So conditions have changed. Uh, what happens is that the basically states and cities, if we use that money, we end up making a promise to the federal highways that here's how we'll use the facility, we'll use it as a, as a high occupancy. Having said that, I don't really know of a lot of places that have three carpool lanes, and I'm happy to take that conversation back to the state and, and see uh, you know, whether uh, there are ways. Uh, I know that the uh, state highway department has been out in the forefront right now just uh, you know, being, using common sense and making changes throughout the island. And, I'll, I'll have that conversation with my counterpart, Ed Sniffen, at the state to, uh, to just see it. I can't make any promises because it isn't uh, a city roadway, it's a state roadway, but certainly your comment makes, uh, makes good sense to me. Um, the carpool hours, again, th those are things that are uh, regulated uh, by the Federal Highways Administration. The state uh, tries to, you know, has to ab abide by some of them. They have made uh, over the years, they have made uh, uh, liberalizations. At one point, if you recall, the carpool lanes were both uh, going eastbound into town. They were both uh, in the a.m. and the p.m. Well, it didn't make any sense to have carpool lanes uh, coming outbound from Honolulu to toward here in the morning being carpool lanes. So some of that was, uh, you know, just common sense prevailed, uh, and they, they made those changes. But again, I'll take the, the issue to, uh, to the state. Now, your first issue was tickets uh, on the freeway for compliance uh, reasons. I'm not sure exactly uh, where it is, and I, I think I would rather have uh, my counterparts here from yeah. HPD uh, try to answer that yeah. question uh, because, they, they, you know, they are the ones that, uh, that do our enforcement. I, you know, they, I mean, all of us here, I, I just have to say this, that, you know, there was an, there was an NPR story I think today or yesterday, uh, just talking about how la in the last, okay, for the last 40 years, we have seen a reduction in traffic fatalities. We used to have 60,000 deaths a year on our highways, and we went down to below 39,000 or something. Now, 39,000 a year, that's the Vietnam War. I mean, that's, uh, that's a lot of people. But for the last five years, uh, and particularly since COVID, we're back up to 44,000, and we're, the, we're one of the few industrialized countries in the world where all of a sudden our, uh, our highway deaths and our, and our serious injuries are, are going the wrong way. 
you know, on, on this island alone, we, we lose one person a week on the highways right now. We lose, I think last year, I think we had 60 deaths on our Oahu streets. Uh, we, had, we had 400 people that had their life changed through serious injuries. You just got to think of those numbers. Uh, so, uh, you know, first and foremost, as a transportation person, uh, you know, we all have to be looking. Uh, the, the first prior priority for all of us is to do whatever we can to try to uh, improve safety on our streets. Uh, for our keiki, for, for our, our kapuna, for everybody, uh, that's got to be our first priority. But. I've done my lecture here and my, my stuff, so Thank I'll you, ask Roger. the HPD to come yeah. up. Why don't you just give her Ed Sniffen's personal cell number? <laughs> you know, you could, you could try that. Michelle, I'm only kidding with Michelle Kidani. I wouldn't do that to Ed. Keith. All right. Uh, aloha. Uh, thank you for that question. And, um, you know, I, I am a Milani commuter, too. I've been uh, driving from here to uh, Tom, you know, almost every morning for about 30 years also. So I, I, hear, I hear your concerns as well. But bottom line, as uh, Mr. Morton said, you know, it, it is about safety. Um, in the morning time, you'll, you'll see uh, primarily our solo bike officers on the road. Um, they're traffic division, so they're, they're not assigned to patrol. They're a specialized unit, and their focus is really on, on traffic safety and, uh, and, and the flow. So not, um, so I mean, I'll tell you straight off is that they're, they're, not, they're not out there to get us in the morning. And I say us too because I know where the, I know where the, the uh, speed uh, the, the folks are posted to, and I slow down. I don't want to get ticketed to, right? Um, <laughs> but then, bottom line is that you know, it, they're they're there to um, again facilitate traffic flow. Um, you know, whenever there's an accident or a stall, they're on it. So what, what that reduces is the time to to respond because if if not for them, right, um, they would have to call patrol. So patrol would have to get them to the freeways and get to that locations. But by having our solo bike officers already pre-staged on, on the freeways in in certain areas. Um, you know, they're, they're able to, to get to um, traffic um, incidents very quickly, and, and they do so very, very, very good. Um, uh, coupled with the, um, the tool wagons that, that, are, uh, that are always online too, I mean, that, that's really the bottom line. Um, at, at, at the same time, if there's any kind of, you know, we, we all see them too, we all see that maniac driver that's driving about 80 miles an hour, you know, we, weaving through traffic, they can't, you know, we can't just ignore that. So they're, they're going to tag those, those, they're going to pull over and tag those kind of, those kind of drivers. So again, it's all about safety. You know, we just had, we just lost that McKinley High School student a few weeks ago. Um, that's our focus. And that's, that's really what the intent is. It's not to tag people. It's not to, to, you know, raise money for the, the city funds. It's all about safety. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Shereen. Is that okay? Um, I, I really appreciate that, and I'm hoping that you'll reconsider and... Um, well, at, well at I, least, think, I think I what Roger's think, offered yeah. to do, to look at the carpool lane based yeah. on the three things that you talked about, mm -hmm. maybe may be a good win for you in there. Yeah, I, I think that's one part, but I think the other part of the officers and the timing of when you're on, your, on the road, let, just let us get to work and let us get back home. That's all we're asking for. Yeah, but again, you know, these... Um, the, the prime, you know, the drive times, that's when we need to have our officers out there. We need to have them on station, ability to, um, to respond to, to stalls and accidents and get them and clear the roadways. That, that's the bottom line. So if not for that, I mean, it'll, it'll take patrol to, to respond and it, it'll, it'll really um, aggravate traffic issues. So that's really what, why they're there. It's not, again, it's not to tag people, it's not to inconvenience. And, you know, we don't want to clog up the roadways either by, by doing traffic stops, on, you know, during uh, rush hour. But... You know, sometimes we have to out of necessity, but it's really about safety and, and traffic flow. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Shireen. Thank you, sir. If I, I meant to say, when you, you come up, if I don't already know your name, I tried to, but I didn't meet this gentleman. Please tell us your name and, and your question. Okay, good. Sure. Uh, my name is Walter Now Young. I want to be the representative from my street, um, Pioneer Place. And the issue I wanted to tack on was the trees. The tree in our neighborhood has been a problem for our whole street okay. uh, from the time it was born. And I understand they have a list of a, a so appropriate trees, which this, is, this one is not on that list. And it has caused a, okay. a great deal right. of problem. So we've already covered the topic. What we'll do is we'll get the name of your street, we'll get right. your name. We'll follow but, that, up. but my issue is that oh. I've been trying to do this issue for a number of years, and the phone book, the telephone numbers, I tried to call, and nobody calls me back. Really? So I appreciate this opportunity yeah. to take care of that problem. Where's Mufi Hanneman when we need him? <laughs> Hanneman, Mufi's fault. Cardwell. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we'll get, we'll get you. <laughs> 
Right. I understand. Yeah, he, he would love that. I was just talking I to just him. Wanted, he I just it. wanted to take yeah. the opportunity to resolve the issue. We will. Okay? That's why you're here. Well, it's Walter, right? Walton. 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 Yeah. We got it. All right, And uh, Laurie knows me. <laughs> okay. All right. We got it. We got it. We'll see what we can get done. Okay. Thank right. you. You're welcome, Walton. Ladies. Hello. Yeah. You, can somebody raise? I can. Okay. See, this is not too bad, huh? This is moving <laughs> along pretty good. First, my name is Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. I'm representing Milani High School. Yeah, okay. So thank you for hosting this town hall tonight. I'm a current student here at AM MMHS. First, I want to thank our HPD District 2 Community Policing Division. Shout out to Officer Tim. The current partnership with the high school has been awesome. The second point is that we want to thank Scott Gatto for supplying our su club supplies to cover the graffiti but our question is, can you help find a solution to the graffiti in our community, specifically the ones on trees? Oh, wow, that's, that's a good question. You know, I would tell you that the issue of graffiti comes up a lot. Between that and vandalism, it can make you crazy. You know, does anybody who wants to, anybody here want to talk about graffiti, especially graffiti on trees? I don't know if that's even something that we have. I don't think we have a plan for it. I promise you we'll kind of take that into consideration. Um, I know that um, in, in the city, in, in the urban core, we've done a number of neighborhood cleanups, especially in Chinatown with other community groups, and invariably there's always some group out there painting over some kind of graffiti. Sir. Yeah, uh, sorry, my name is Taino Jima. I'll take that question. So graffiti is a problem, but the best thing to do is what we have is we do track it. So if you see graffiti in the area, a lot of times it's important to call the police and can track it. Sometimes it depends on what kind of graffiti it is. We can actually track it and find out who does it. The idea is try to catch them and try to rehabilitate them as best as possible. But you're right, if you do see graffiti, the best thing is to report it, because if it's not reported to us, we can't track it. We do have a computer system that tracks most crimes. And sometimes, if stationed correctly, we can actually see the locations of these graffiti incidents. But we're not gonna get nothing until someone reports it to us. So in that kind of case, if it's reported to us, we can track it that way. That's great. Is there an online source for the reporting? There is an online source, but it's better to talk to the police officer in person because that way we can photograph it and see what we have there. Because a lot of times online, it does go through a system, but to have an officer actually see that and have somebody give a statement to say when it happened or when it did not happen, we can also lock down the time the graffiti happened. It's important that we get as much information we have so that we can actually track certain crimes, such as graffiti. Does that help you out? Yes, All thank right. you. Thanks for your nice acknowledgement. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so if I remember correctly, it's chemo, right? It is chemo. Chemo. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Kimo Chan. I'm a lifelong resident of Midalani. I'm representing the Hawaii Inline Hockey, Inc. Um, we're a youth-based hockey program um, running out of the Ten Acre Park in Midalani, and um, yeah, uh, just give a little backstory. You know, we started off like the roller girl, um, not girl, sorry, roller, <laughs> roller, roller group here, and um, you know, we were playing on basketball courts and volleyball courts, and you know, we were getting it everyone's way. And in 2000, after petitioning, well, like my parents and their friends petitioned to have a court built, it was finally built in 2000. So it's been um, about 23 years since uh, any kind of improvements or upkeep. Um, from the state has taken place. So yeah, we're just here uh, petitioning, asking for your guys' help. What can we do as a community together to get this um, place um, the best as it can be, especially for you know the keiki. And I have my son here. He's gonna ask one question for you guys. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Kimo, and I'm an inline ro roller hockey player. Can you please help us improve our ranks? All right, with. Very good, Kimo. <laughs> Improve our rinks with lights, a roof, and tiles. There you go. Thanks, yeah. Dad. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, just use your kid like that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. We, we want, we, we're going to be on this, okay? I promise. Okay. All, right? all right? We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Kimo, thank you. Good job, all right. Jamie, Jamie, come on up. That's a tough act to follow. So I will have a question that has to do with residential A. 
Um, but first I'll give the context. And I know I look like I just stepped off the plane, but my people stepped off a boat in 1860s in Kauai High Harbor. So we've been here for a long time. My grandmother was born here when it was still the monarchy and to her dying day, she was a loyal uh, person to Queen Liliuokalani. And so it was always very important to her. And in 1924, she bought some property, went back to school teaching elementary school in Wahiwa so that she could afford to buy uh, a place on the North Shore. And uh, so that property is, has been transferred from her to my mother and my mom, rather than give it to her children, did what she could and pass it on to the next generation. So I am just a caretaker of this. And I think I represent a lot of people who, uh, you know, have are struggling with residential A uh, category. It's for anyone who owns a property that they do not live in. Well, you know, all residential A owners are not created equal. So, you know, back, here's a little anecdote. When I was young and going to uh, middle school, uh, I, I uh, con involuntarily contributed a lot of my lunch money to uh. Some, some fellows who were uh, more determined to have my lunch money than I was to hold on to it. All right. Well, Jamie, no I need you to ask a question. Here's my question. I am hopeful that the uh, city of Honolulu will address the issue of Kama'aina flight, who often, for generations before me, my generation, generations after me, will have to seriously consider leaving their home, having their children stay here with them, because there are unintended consequences from residential A category. It, it solved the problem, but it created other problems when it was created. Because there are those who have not just arrived here and have lots of money to buy properties. Well, so the question okay. is, will the city be willing to take on this problem and find other categories, perhaps, that will address long-term rental properties, which is what most residential A people are trying to do. I'm going to ask Carrie Castle to come up, but I can tell you, in light of what's happened this past year with the tax assessments being what they were, it caught us all by surprise, which is why we've issued this program, which is historic on the tax exemptions. I'll let Carrie, Capri, Carrie again is our Deputy Director for Budget and Fiscal Services. Carrie. Good evening. I, I apologize. I missed your first name. James Parker. James. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, your question is has been raised. Um, it, it is a concern with residents for the different situations. Um, what happened in this last tax assessment year was, as as many people know, was unprecedented, and it really affected. Um, besides, you know, the general population, uh, it really affected those in residential A type categories. Uh, there are a number of bills that are um, being introduced uh, as we speak uh, in city council, and particularly with respect to residential A, there is uh, there's several that we're looking at in terms of um, uh, um, increasing the amount that instead of the one million dollar limit, increasing it to something like a, a million two, a million five. Um, so. I, I, gosh, there's a number of um, bills, as I mentioned, that uh, city council administration were looking at to offer some kind of relief uh, to the taxpayers. Yeah, you know, Carrie, if I could just add, I mean, because we have Matt Wire in the room in Val Okimoto, this is a council issue as well, especially on, on taxes. So we hear, Jamie, I, I can tell you that this year, because it was such an aberration, has sparked. Uh, a lot of conversations about taxes. And so, uh, best I can tell you is to hang in there. We're gonna look at every single thing. I don't have any, this is too complicated to give you an immediate answer tonight, but it is something that's being looked at in earnest, okay? Well, I do know, just one follow-up, I do know that the, you always hear that the state of Hawaii, you know, is trying to deal with the affordable housing issue. And, you know, in my particular case, I'm just trying to maintain long-term rental and, and 
hopefully some accommodation could be made to long-term rentals. Well, I think in knowing the particulars, and I, I kind of want to move it on because we've got sure. a long line forming. Sure. I think you have a great case for an appeal. We talked about that earlier with Krishna. And I think you should do that under your circumstances, given the, the long-term rental situation, right. okay? All right, thank you all, all right, for your Jamie, time. thank you, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Oh, you want to add something? I was just going to add that uh, specific to long-term rentals. Again, there is a bill that is uh, has been introduced and uh, is being uh, discussed. So, thank you. Okay. I, you know, one more last editorial note. We're really sensitive on the housing front beyond what you can imagine because we understand we understand what's at stake here and the crisis that we're in. And the last thing we want is any more out migration that we're already going through. It takes up a large part of our day and our evening and the things we've committed ourselves to. And so uh, just know that we don't take this kind of stuff casually. And I really appreciate you coming forward with this, Jamie. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Aloha mai kako. And before I get started, as much as I would like to thank you folks all for being here tonight and Mayor, Coach. Um, I would also like to thank my fellow community members that have come out. So if you don't mind, would you here from the city and county, please give a hand to our residents that came out tonight. So that being said, <clears throat> my name is TJ Charisma. T like terrific, J like January. C-U-A-R-E-S-M-A. -E my phone number is 808-238. 9427. And the reason that I'm not afraid to give you my number is because for those of those community members here tonight, you know who I am, you know what I do, you know what I'm about. So I don't mind sharing my phone number. My first, um, my first comment is actually to the gentleman who said he was looking for admin, plumbers, electricians. I put in an application and waited almost 14 weeks before I got an answer that told me you're not qualified enough. Mr. Babcock, you know who I am. Mr. Formsby, Director Don, uh, Mr. Morton. So you all know what my qualifications are. And I was told that I was not qualified. Um, and the second thing is, are you going to be able to shorten that time from when someone submits an online application and shorten the process of actually interviewing and onboarding someone to the city and county because like Jamie said, there are a lot of our, my sons, both of my sons live on the West Coast and they're not coming back. So, but um, if you don't mind, I just have two more questions after down, real quick ones though. Yeah. So thank you, I appreciate your comment. Bugs, you wanna address that real, let's, let's address the first one. Go ahead, Bugs. Um, with re respect to your application, um, when Mayor came in, he was completely unsatisfied with the process. It took us 181 days to onboard somebody from the time we started, uh, when somebody ap applies until we actually make an offer. We're making some progress. We've uh, made some efficiency improvements. We're not there yet, but we're making progress. Um, with your specific application, I'll give you my card. You can contact me and we'll follow up. Yeah, but I don't want to be discussing your qualifications right. here tonight. Oh, okay? Actually, uh, I'm not on the market. I actually work for a private okay. company. Since I put in my application, a private company hired me, right. and I'm happy where I am. I and, run and, their uh, HR department. Yes, TJ, and thank you. But that is a problem we're facing with government because, again, with this competitive uh, market, it's hard for us to, if, if we don't get somebody on board really quickly within two weeks or so, we're gonna lose them. And our director is completely on board with that. She's realized we need to make changes and we are in the middle of that. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you're a white little grad, yes. I am, yeah. 83 bulldogs. Yeah. Okay. We're, bulldogs. Com we're coming up on 40 years, yeah. so thank you. I recognize you, you TJ. <laughs> I know, I recognize you too. But <laughs> we you. have to be, you know, we have to be above board. Absolutely, so, um, yeah. So no, thank you. Thank you. And actually my next couple of questions actually have to do with DPP. And I love you guys in DPP, now get me wrong. But uh, my first issue at DPP is the flood that we had in 2021, and it affected Waialua Beach Road, and it flooded residents there. And for those of you that are part of this, that, um, this body here tonight that actually came out with Haima at that time, um, U.S. Rep. Kai Kahele and everybody else, that residence that you walked into that was flooded and you folks saw the 14 inches of mud, that was my cousin's house. And there is actually another resident here tonight. His family lives on that land, and they've been on that land for 100 years. Okay. Ka'amo'oloa Stream 
and the rain actually came down and flooded the houses and the properties along Wailua Beach Road near the wastewater uh, treatment plant TJ, at what's your question? So I'm, my question really is... familiar with that 21 story. Right. Very so familiar. the question is, when is DPP going to actually enforce the 13 properties, enforce the violations against the 13 homeowners there who have illegally built driveways and installed their own pipes into that stream that continues to flood each and every time it rains. It's been two years, March, and nothing has yet been done. Okay. Donna, is this you? Yeah, I okay. think so. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. And we will take those addresses and go back and, and check. And if we need to send out inspectors and issue violations, we will do that. Oh, no, issues have, violations have already been issued. Okay. There's 13 of them, 13 residences, totaling 27 violations, if I'm not mistaken, and nothing has yet been done. Okay, so we, maybe we need to, uh, we'll look at it, see where it is in the process, if we've issued fines, es escalated it to notices of order, um, and if there needs to be further steps that need to be taken to bring these properties into compliance, then we will. Thank you very much. If I could much. just add, and then we'll just wrap this, okay? Um, we didn't really like the way the city was imposing fines and not collecting, and you may or may not have read about it, but with respect to short-term illegal vacation rentals, but it also resonates within DPP. For the first time, we've hired an outside collection agency, and we, we intend on collecting on fines. In fact, we intend on imposing very heavy fines because that's the only way we're going to... Without that consequence, we're not going to get the results we want. That's brand new. Uh, this collection agency, which took us quite a while to be able to set up, to be able to do, took us almost a year to do that, but they're now in place and have been for the last couple of weeks. We also hired more inspectors for DPP to get out in the field. So we're absolutely determined, first of all, to manage tourism much better than it has been here historically, but to follow up on stuff like this, because your lament is something we heard a lot of. And I don't think as a city, and even though we talk all the time about being more of a facilitator, a partner, not a regulatory body that says no, you know, we also know that as a community, we have to have rules and people have to understand what those rules are. So please know that we'll get those addresses. We will follow up. Thank you. Fair? And actually my last, my last you comment. You all used your quota of three, but no, go ahead. My last comment is actually to, um, you're the new director of DPP? Since yes. September, but she's okay. been the deputy for the whole time we've been in office. Okay, okay. great. So I would like for you to call me, 808-238-9427. You can get my number from anybody. You gotcha. can replay the video and get it. But my family is the family that lives in Kukia Circle with the veteran that's about to pass, and we've been waiting to hear at that time from Lester Hirano, who is no longer in right. DPP, mm -hmm. in, in, with respect to the fines that we've been trying to settle. So any conversation that we can have, unfortunately, my uncle is probably not gonna live much longer. Mm -hmm. He's a three-time war veteran, and I would like to get this settled before he passes, so if you don't mind. And my last comment, Ernie Lau, we love you and we love what you're doing for Red Hill. So everyone, could we get a nice round of applause for Ernie Lau, my hero. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, CJ. Sir. You're going to have a chemo here. <clears throat> chemo. chemo. You're going to have a chemo here. Oh, I guess chemo. I'm number three here. Um, the reason I'm here is uh, for the past years I've been getting frustrated over the airplanes that are going by. It's like, uh, right. I think a lot of people can go for that. It's like they're training in, in, in the oh, mainland yeah. area. And what they do is that, I got nothing better to do, I'm a retiree. So I watch the planes, they, they just go and turn the engine off. They're on training from what I heard. Right. Trainees, I won't mention a guy named Mutomi, but they're actually training over Mililani and they turn their engine off. I'm a motorcycle rider, I'm pretty familiar with engines. And then it comes quiet. And it kicks the it, zoom, and it goes again. Why can't they do the training Kunia or beyond that by the mountains? Why do they have to go over a residence? We've got grandkids here. I've got my grandkids. I've got my family. <clears throat> so as Michael just said to me, so you know, it's federal and state. That said, next week, Mike and I are going to meet with Admiral Aguilino. We met with him this week as well. Thank He's you. head of Indopaycom. We'll raise the issue. Scott told me tonight we would probably hear about that. Um, I can tell you, in the city, we hear about ambulances and sirens. 
you know, from police cars and stuff. I understand it. And we hear in Waikiki about ambient noise because of all the amplifiers. Yeah. Really noise, don't is, know, noise has become yeah. an issue. There's no I really question. don't know where to go because I was in the military right. for 27 years. Yeah. Now I come here, I, I'm trying to talk to whoever, the city, the state, the federal, nobody do anything. So well, we'll try to find out. Thank you for holding this, by the way. I You're appreciate welcome, that. Sir. You're welcome. I appreciate Kimo. Okay. I appreciate the question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye -bye. All right. <laughs> sir. How's it going? Uh, my name is Les Among with the Millie Lenny Neighborhood Board. Hi, I'm Les. Thanks for being on the board. Co-chair of the Homeless uh, Committee on our board. Okay. Uh, I want to ask a question of you. We're having uh, a crisis with the homeless situation in Hawaii. Um, 2005 and 2006, when I was working at the state capitol, I went to the representatives and the senators, and while I was working there, and I was at the time, the homeless situation was starting to fizzle and get worse and worse yeah. by the day. Since that time, we have to, what I think is an overblown homeless issue that we still haven't addressed correctly. I don't know if the state and the city are teaming together and well, have the right Well, actually, we are beginning to team together since Governor right. Green got in. And we're, but, but go ahead, I want to yeah, hear. The, the right initiatives that yeah. need to be taken up you know, and put on the table as far as, uh, well, the other gentleman that was talking earlier, he was talking about affordable housing. That has a lot to do with the homeless situation too, with affordable housing. I know a lot of people living on the beach that have jobs that can't afford rent. Right. And they go out and try to rent a place. And then you got these uh, scammered realtors, that most of them are greedy, um, but they're, they're charging $100 just to fill out an application. And that's ridiculous. You can't be scamming people, and it's just a small part of what's going on. Everything from one level to the top level needs to be addressed once and for all. I've been watching this since I worked at the state capitol in 2005, and I'm very disappointed with our, our state, how it, how it addressed this. We can do this. I know we, we can. can do this. I, I feel you're the right guy to really get this done, but it's going to take teamwork. And people have to take this seriously. Well, we're doing some unprecedented things, but we have Ian here. Ian, want to talk a little bit about the core program? One of the things that we Excellent. knew coming into office is what was going on prior was it working, and that was the whole compassionate disruption. That put the police department at the tip of the spear from a 911 call. This is what would happen. They would come, and subsequently they would also call an ambulance from EMS, and they would come. And then depending on the nature of the situation, EMS would typically pick up the person. This is maybe not so much out here, because it's migrated out here now, but in the urban core. And then take them to the Queens Hospital, because they took on the most of them. Uh, Straub took on some, but Queens really took the, the brunt of all of it, and still does. And uh, within an hour or two after they cleaned them up, and if they performed a little bit of medical care, turned them back out on the street, and it just wasn't working. Well, we've taken a very different approach to what we're doing, but it takes a while. I like what we've got set up right now. What we're right on the threshold of doing, and I don't know how far you want to go with this thing, because I talked to Jim, Dr. Jim Island, our director today, is we need places to put people. And we are right there, right now, and working collaboratively with the state um, at at um, providing places where our core team, which now responds, they intercept the 911 calls. We don't have our police go out. We don't have to send out EMS and, and, and treat people. And what we now need places to put them and give them what, was what we want from the state is the wraparound services. But I'm not gonna take any thunder away from Ian because Ian knows this inside out. I think you can speak best to what we're doing. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the question. Again, with the collaboration between the city's Office of Housing, the Department of Community Services, and our department, Honolulu Emergency Services Department, about a year ago, they started the core program, our crisis outreach and response and engagement. It was to address the main uh, issue of homelessness in the downtown urban core area. And through that program, we work with the nonprofits throughout the entire island, through IHS, H3RC, Catholic Charities, Partners in Care, a lot of the outreach homeless providers. And with that program, 
program, we take it one step at a time to get the people off the street. And the challenges with our houseless population is there's the extremes. On one side, people need the help and they don't have the money and they need the resource. And then there's the other side where there's the people that just want to live on the street. And then there's the group in the middle. So we're working with all aspects of that. And what we've done is one person at a time, we work with them to get the resources. We started in downtown Chinatown. We branched out to Waikiki now. We're branching out onto the other parts of the island. And after this, I can give you my number and we can talk more about specific hotspots in the area of Mililani, Waihiwa, Wailua area that we can help you folks with. And as the mayor pointed out, the biggest challenge, and anybody will know there's no place for these people to go. The houseless population are houseless, and there's not a place to put them into an emergency shelter. So we're working to try and find shelters, also to get people there. As my director Ireland says all the time is, you know, if it was an easy solution, if easy solution it would be solved already. Yeah, but I think you should comment on the fact that we know the shelters also don't work. Correct, and I was gonna get to that. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> because that's well, another that, thing that was not working that everybody thought was the panacea. In, but in it 2005, uh, when I was at the Capitol working, I suggested uh, that we should have the, some of the beaches where people will get permits to go down to the beaches, right? And the city is uh, taking care of the, the restroom facilities and that. And if we could have homeless people brought to certain beach places and then from that place you have them, a social programs come in and assist and the city come in and assist and then the city was right there too. And you could even have a program where some of the homeless guys can help clean up the park or whatever while they're being assisted. There's, there's many levels of this that can be done, you see. And uh, affordable housing too can, be ha can happen if we could just, uh, um, like, like when I was on the Waikiki Neighborhood Board years ago. Yeah. Less, okay, you made your point. We're talking about homeless. I want you to hear from everybody. Let me tell you part of the problem that he said. 50% or maybe a little bit more of the people who are homeless are either mentally ill, drug addicted, or alcohol related addictions, okay? That doesn't make for putting everybody out on the beach. We already have enough problems. We've been out there in Makaha and what goes on at night after hours and whatever. You just can't do that. Yeah, I, I don't mean okay? a, a public beach. I mean, like, a, this beach would be designated for, a, you know, a, it would be a, some beach, you know, away. I'm trying to tell you this out of sight, out of mind, find a place to put all of them who need that kind of care doesn't work. It's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for criminal activity yeah, I of which we've been working on. I, the only reason I brought that up is a place to process them and then you get your mentally ill. You have the people that are Well, that's the work. wraparound services, but you have to do that somewhere else other than a beach, and that's yeah. what we're trying to tell Eventually, you. it's a processing thing. You have to that's process correct. them. Yeah. There's yeah. no yeah. simple yeah. answer. There's a multitude of yeah. things okay. we're working on I, on a lot of levels. I absolutely know. I think you're the right man to get this done, but I thank really you. do. Thank you, Les. Well, it's a team. I can promise you. Edward, yeah, that's good. Yeah, Edward's yeah. going to make one more comment and then go ahead please do i don't know ian go ahead i don't want to cut you off no, no. i love this guy this this guy <laughs> i'll get your number two yeah no we'll come i'll come right after this sir i'll, I'll come on the board yet. and then i think um edward from the department of community services actually has a, a statement for what's actually going to happen in this community specifically so folks on the wahiwa community board so i'm oh, sorry uh, edward lost balance deputy director of department of community services so folks on the wahiwa community uh, neighborhood board if you're monitoring that you know that the city and county of Honolulu is looking to acquire a 24 room facility um, over there in Wahiwa. So part of it, like the mayor is saying, is our, our strategy right now is to improve the way we engage our community to improve our success rate, but also to provide resources and kind of meet folks where they're at. So we are looking to acquire and, and we're probably gonna close in days, not weeks away from uh, creating a facility in Wahiwa. Uh, folks on the neighborhood board, you know, we've, we've been communicating uh, on this matter and we'll communicate, you know, as we, define the services in there. We're not going to drop something uh, in the middle of a community that the community doesn't want. We're going to keep that messaging up and it shouldn't come to a surprise to anybody. Good All right, I'll, I'll get well, my number. Go ahead. I, you give me your number. We, we, yeah. I want to move on because you've got people behind yeah, yeah. you. That's what I was just it's already say. In the interest of time, I got, thank you. Right. Appreciate Les, it. thank you. No, I appreciate no, you. Right. I appreciate your confidence in this, Les. I do. Yes, ma'am. Hello. There you go. Hello, my Hi. name is Imelda. Hi, I'm a Imelda. long time resident of um, Mililani, and I also work downtown. So I am a potential user of the, the train if um, conditions are ideal. So all my questions are for Lori. So thank you for coming hey, out. She was just said to me, I hope, she just said, I hope, I hope she asked me a question. Good. <laughs> yes, so my first question is about the, the cracks 
that's already in the rail. Um, I know there's plans, I, I mean, you, you all are fixing it with epoxy, and, um, but I was just wondering if that's going to be sustainable when the rail is actually in use and a thousand pounds are going uh, back and forth on these, these trains, so. So the hammerhead cracks, so there are 21 on the west side that have been affected, and all, they have all been epoxy injected to stop the cracks from growing, getting water and additional debris in there. But there are eight that have, um, they're all structurally safe, but we, the longevity of those cracks, the longevity of the structure is what we're doing, what we're fixing. So we actually are doing post-post tensioning. So we have a cage of rebar that was manufactured in the mainland and it was shipped last week. So it should arrive this week and we're gonna install them. So structurally, the, the, the columns are fine, but it's just to extend the life of it. So don't think that we're just epoxy coating. That's just, to pre that's just a preventative measure. So that part is already done. Okay, all right, thank you. And then um, Paul Highlands. Yes. So what is the uh, truthful feasibility of having a park parking structure out there? So for the parking structure out there, and I understand, I understand that you, the, you folks were committed to have some kind of parking structure over there, but it just did not make financial sense. There's soft substrate under there, and so that's what made the structure so expensive. We would have to um, reinforce the material under there, because it's a stream that was really being built over. So for a 1600 stall, I mean a 1600 parking stall structure, it was gonna cost millions of dollars. So each parking stall was gonna cost $206,000. It just did not make financial sense. So we do owe the community an answer. We don't have one yet. So myself and Roger Morton, and in fact, the council just um, put up a resolution that we find a, a solution for the community on the North Shore and the Central Oahu. So some things that we are looking at, I've already talked to LCC and Alexander and Baldwin, so that's the LCC campus. And if we could build a parking structure over there, and they, they didn't slam the door in my face, but they're really concerned because there's a single tiny little road that gets into that campus. And so they're worried, okay, if we have, you know, 1,600 people parking over there and emergency happens, how are you gonna get all of those people out of there, all of their cars out of there? So we would have to address that. If we do put something there, we would have to have a nice, on ramp. At A and B, they were fine with that. That's at the Pearl Highlands Shopping Center. So they're fine with us building a structure over there. All their main concern was making sure we separate the rider parkers, parking people, and the customers. But that's simply, that's easy to solve with a, a ticketing system. And then one of our board members said, why don't we do a spur up here? I, had, I did have a manufacturer, a parking structure manufacturer approach me a couple of months ago. It's a robotic robotic uh, structure, it's half the weight. So we could put something over there. I worry because it's a lot of mechanical moving parts, but that's something, that's just four ideas that we've just talked off the, off the top of our heads, nothing in depth that has gone into it. So DTS actually has a consultant that's gonna start looking at different options and we have to do it holistically because even if we have a parking structure at Pearl Highlands, it's difficult to get there. So if someone's coming down from H2 and I have to go all these little side roads just to get to that parking structure, forget it. I'm gonna stay in my car and continue on to downtown. So we have to look holistically that whole area, how are we actually gonna properly serve the community. Okay, and then also I would like to suggest um, perhaps uh, building a walkway in yes. that area in lieu of the crosswalk because right yes. now I see that, I think, that would be a potential disaster because I've seen cars on that road and if, you know, during rush hour, they're going really fast on that road. And if they have yes. to stop for pedestrians <laughs> yep. crossing that street, that's yes. gonna cause a lot of backup traffic. And then also yes. um, on the weekends, you know, they're... Absolutely, you know, I agree with you. And so what we've put in is a temporary measure so that we can open up the first segment. To what Mayor is saying, even I'm new here, right? I've only been here two years. So there are some decisions that were made in the past that I don't have control over. So we worked with HDOT to put something in temporarily. And actually there was a fireman that came and approached us and said, he's a, bike, he's a bicyclist. And he says, what you have put in there is not safe. And so we went out there and we, we took a look at how can we improve things. So I actually called Ed Sniffin. 
you know, one of the suggestions was to slow down the cars is to put one of those speed tables in. And he said, yes, go ahead and put that in. It's at our, our cost. And any other things that we can make it safe. But understand this is temporary for now. I think DTS actually has a project or looking at a project to do an over passenger walkway because you're right, that's not sustainable. It's not safe in the long run. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Imelda, thank you. Lori Kai Keen is a hell of an engineer. And I'm gonna go on record of telling you, I'm the fourth mayor to touch rail. And the very fact that we're about to begin operating it in July, given the obstacles that we had to overcome, and going honestly, what it means for this island, uh, I'm very, very grateful. Lori, her team, Roger, who's going to operate and maintain it with the city. And the only last thing I'll say about it is that there's so much that's going to happen as a result of rail going forward. This is a transformative project. And there are going to be things in positive ways that will be constructed that, that will make sense, not only in housing, but in other kinds of amenities and whatever. That's just going to unfold. This is, this is really a 100-year project, and we're doing this for future generations. So you, I ask you to just have a little bit of faith, if you will, and, and trust in, in, in the future. And we don't have that ability to predict it right now, but I'll say the last thing. To build a garage at Pro City Highlands, it was over $30 million for 1,600 stalls at a cost per $206,000 per stall. Probably would have meant we'd have to start pay, charging people $100 a day to park. I don't think we'd have that crowd doing that just to make it sense. So that, this was a financial decision because it didn't make sense. Doesn't mean there isn't an alternative. We just don't have that right now. Ma'am, you're up. Uh, good evening. My name is Patricia Williams. I'm a 45 year resident of a nearby YPO Gentry. I have three issues, including some that maybe we'll touch on the other department heads that don't have anything to do. <laughs> anyway. Um, the first is a little one. Uh, there are three questions. One, the first one that I've had as a long time, uh, as a you know lifelong resident of Hawaii, is renaming uh, governmental facilities or parks, and whether that does anyone know if that affects the taxpayers? Is there ever a study done to rename uh, something? It, well, I, I love I've I I was there before Corp was built, the regional park. I saw the trees come up. And so I always call it Corp, Central Oahu Regional Park. Right. Now I love Patsy Mink. I, I went to school, we played athlete, uh, volleyball, athletics with you. So I love the fact of what she represents. Uh, the Daniel Kainoi Airport, I know that's a state facility, but I often wonder how much it costs the taxpayers to change all the IT, all the procurement forms, business cards, inventory, uh, personnel, mat letterhead. This, is anything done prior to just renaming something? And can that be, uh, can we honor people in another way, like finding something that's newly built to put their name on it? How much did those signs at the Central Regional Park cost us? Okay. They're copper. All right, Makanani. Hey, Makanani, you're Just a Aloha. question. Aloha, Makanani Salah, Office of Culture and the Arts. Uh, thank you for the question. I think you're hitting on something that has been really important to a lot of the community lately, which is um, renaming things and assuring that names are adherent to what the community wants. In terms of costs for changes of signage, the primary hard cost is going to be the cost to actually change the you know, bronze signage, metal signage that is installed on the building, which is, it's not negligent, you know, we're talking anywhere in the, depending on the size of the sign, I can't tell you for that one, but for signage that we've been doing, it's anywhere from $300 to, you know, $2,000 on the average. Um, but also usually when we do this, things like business cards and things like that are sort of spread across um, a lot of the departments. So it's something that's much less arduous for us. So the primary thing is really signs, and we're trying to do it um, to respond to what the community brings um, or the, what the community would like. And a lot of times it's to honor someone who has done something really significant or to honor a place that was there before. And so, you know, if you guys have something that you would like to talk about, I'm happy to um, discuss it. I, I understand. I was just wondering the cost for IT 
for instance, and whether we could consider in the future just finding something new to name in honor of someone versus changing a name. I can't respond to the IT question, but I did want to share that for for parks when we are renaming or naming a field, that it's normally a community group that's coming to ask, and they go through a process that includes um, working with their neighborhood board. And a lot of times, you know, for parks we have different signage, the the copper or the brown and yellow sign. Those are like the prime signs that we have, but a lot of these community groups also donate. So they pay okay. for signage to be put up okay. in the park, yeah, so. I just didn't know, thank you very much. Ma Mahalo. Okay, second issue, I just didn't realize that trees were gonna be such an issue today. My only question was, there's a fabulous document, this is for CSSR. Yeah, climate change. Parks and system. Recreation. There's an urban tree plan dated uh, March 2019. And um, I'm only interested because in our neighborhood, all the trees are falling and causing problems, so we've had to uproot them. So we want to start a memorial tree planting project. So I'm learning a whole lot about trees I never knew before, like what not to plant. And I was just wondering what happened to the status of this plan that was in final draft. I tried to call, it's now 2023. Did it, nobody knows who wrote this wonderful thing and whether it'll ever be the goal is 100,000 trees to be planted by 2025 and for the urban canopy to be increased by 35% by 2035. And where are we with those goals? Yeah, great question. So also recognizing that the Department of Parks and Recreation's logo is on that report as well. Uh, and as a, <laughs> as a co-author of it a couple of years ago, there's a lot of great values and policy statements in there that uh, past administration and city council has identified. That particular number of trees is actually a community-wide educational campaign. Um, so we actually have a tree tracker online, and just this month we'll be releasing the city's annual sustainability report, which will have the an updated of number of that tree tracker. And if anyone has planted a tree in the last three years, we also welcome your plantings, because again, it was a community-wide campaign. Okay, the you. canopy goal is not to increase it, by 35% is to try to get to 35% within our neighborhoods and communities. So uh, I'll definitely um, look for the final plan. It should be final, but again, these are living documents. They're meant to help set a North Star to inform our operations and maintenance, but ultimately the, the installation of trees or the species that we're looking at, those are within the Department of Parks and Recreation and they work with the Department of Planning and Permitting because they're the ones that help identify what can go in the street. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to move it along. I know you said you had one more, but- I had one more. We have a half an hour left and I've got probably half, more okay. than half hour's questions. What if I talk really fast? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, street signage. Yeah. I was hoping that by the time you leave office, you have six years, we could have a plan okay. for street signs that are missing, unreadable, how high is this uh, canopy here? Yeah. We have streets on the right side in YPO Gentry. There's nine of them. The streets are on the right. The signs are up there in the trees on the left, and they're blue. So nobody can read the them, especially Kupuna. The old blue ones, yeah. Yeah, and then we've got green and white ones and yeah. small cat ones, different fonts, faded. And we have street signs with Hawaiian words misspelled all over the place. And Makanani's got a whole program on that that we're doing. And I don't know if you know, if I were to ask you to take a guess, since you just were so good with the statistics on the trees, how many streets do you think we have in Oahu? I don't know the streets. 8,000. Okay. That's a lot of streets, a lot of street signs on a lot of corners. I said it earlier today about the trees ripping up the roads, fixing the roads and all the things. It's, it's like... If this whole group, if we did nothing, if that's all we did, you know, but I hear you on that. I'm going to give you my neighborhood example and then ask okay. you if you could ask your city people. We, we'll follow up. Just okay. go ahead. There's nine streets in YPO Gentry on the right. Two of them only have green and white signs. Okay. The other ones are up in the tree. Nobody can find them. So if you're looking right to turn and you turn left, you're going to crash into something. I'll tell you what, we'll get your name and number. Okay. We'll follow up. Seriously, we'll follow Look, we're, we're doing this, we're going to do 11 of these, but we're coming back, okay? Okay. This is one time now tonight, but we're going to be back probably next year. But one of our goals here is to be able to say, you know, you asked for this, 
and hopefully we're going to be able to say this is what we got done in a positive way. Because your, you. your big concern was safety. Yep. So I don't know about EMS and fire and police. How in the world do you find streets when there's no signs on them? Yeah. Uh, and can you get your city yeah. staff out of the goodness of their hearts on their way home in their communities to look and see? Because I've seen this for years. No. Had I known, I would have written write them all down for tonight. But Thank you. Kaka Ako Kailua everywhere. Everywhere. Thank I you. know, it's true. It's every I, it's true. It's it, there's no, no more denying. Signs. Guilty is charged, but we got we'll, we'll try to see what we can get done. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone I can talk to specifically? Yes, we'll, we'll, I'll call to you. Yep. <coughs> I just I, I just want to give a plug again for HNL 311 because I'm hearing a lot of these issues and a lot of times we go to that go to that app which you can download to your um, phone or your um, or go to a website but you can take a photograph and it also geocodes there's a map there as well so it can find the location of, of, for those street signs as well so again that's another that's another avenue because I'm hearing a lot of things around here and that's one way that will get HNL 311 yes HNL or Honolulu 311 just do a um, just a search on Honolulu 311 and that'll get you to that web page all right thank you thanks Stephen cross oh Sorry. Molly one quick housekeeping announcement if you have a red Toyota sedan license plate RJT 220 your lights are on, they've been on for the meeting. I'd recommend um, going and turn them off. They're starting to brown out a little. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Okay, Cross, you're up. Hi, Mayor. Hi, oh. Cabinet. Hi, elected officials and community members. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I have three things, I'll keep it quick. Um, for DTS and um, HPD, um, sorry, my name is Cross. I'm from the Wahiwa Lions Club. Um, for DTS and HPD, I brought this up in the Wahiwa Neighborhood Board, um, but for Local Drive and Rose Street, these are the streets near Wahiwa Middle School, um, we've had a lot of complaints about speeding. Um, we've requested um, speed bumps over there. It's been hard to collect. We have a um, fellow Wahiwa um, board member here who's worked on this um, 10 years ago, and the request got rejected. Um, they said they also kind of rejected my petitions um, because we didn't have enough signatures. Um, it's just kind of difficult you know, I'm young, I'm not the most, um, I don't have money, you know, so it's hard for my nine to five and my 5 p.m. to 12 a.m. jobs to get um, enough signatures and also to get um, signatures from uh, property owners. So if we can so find we'll a way down to- So take those addresses. I tell you, there's been a, um, we'll get the information from you, Cross, mm -hmm. and, and we'll, we'll just, because we have been, and it's, not just with Sarah Yar, the young lady that was killed on Kapiolani, mm -hmm. but I've, we've been putting more and more of those speed bumps in and around schools and getting requests now as well. So we'll take down that information and see what we can do. Roger, anything you want to say about it? I mean, real quick, I'm getting concerned about time and the people sure, in yeah. line. We've taken a new look at, at, the, at how we warrant and do those. We have 15 intersections around the island right now that we've warranted uh, and are ready mm -hmm. to go. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, the, we've worked very closely with our state partners, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll get the information from you. I'll give you my card, but we are uh, taking a new look at, at our pedestrian safety uh, traffic control devices. Thank you. All right. Thanks, yeah. Cross. Thank Roger you. Roger Morton, Director of Transportation Services. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Cross. All right. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. My name is Trevor Nagamine. I'm the vice chair of the Mililani Neighborhood Board. Um, Hi, Trevor. My chair, Danielle Bass, is also in line behind me. Um, I have two questions relating to the rail project. Um, number one is, how do we know that the rail is actually going to open in January? I understand that's... You mean in July? Problem. I mean, sorry, July. It's been a long day. Yeah, because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for an answer? Okay. Okay. All right, that's it. That's it. That's as far as you have to go on that one. Next, go ahead. Bring it up. What? Okay. And given that um, Hart has decided not to build a parking structure at the Pearl Highlands or the Wyava Rail Station, is there anything that the city or DTS in particular is going to do for Central Oahu residents who? Well, I think that's a work in progress. I try to say that. I think what you're going to see once the rail becomes operational, and you're a young man, so you're going to see a lot more of it than me, um, is. A real transformation with respect to development along the rail lines, and I do think that there's going to be people who will be interested in some kind of, you know, some kind of.
private partnership or whatever with the city in building facilities like that as housing in and around it starts to expand. You will see that. We, and it's not that I have an ability to predict the future, but I can tell you, in city after city where transportation has been built, housing and retail and things like you're talking about garages and stuff have all followed. Right. I mean, I understand that, but okay. my question is, how are people here in Mililani and Wahiwa actually going to get to the rail line? Because right now, if you want to catch the bus from Mililani to Pearl Highlands, you're catching the 51, which only comes every 40 minutes during the day. Roger. And if you're We're going to increase the bus service. I'll let Roger talk to that. That's a good, yeah. good question. Right. Well, let's, let's take a look at rail as a longer term issue because, uh, you know, we're, the first segment is going to stadium, right? Yeah. Uh, and there are ways you can take the 61, uh, but what our plans are, and I, I'll have to ask Laurie to give me the time frame, but our plans are to build uh, a ramp from H2 that will go directly to the Pearl Highland Station. Now that's not going to be there in July when we open the station, but that's what we're planning to do. It's, it's, on, the, it's on the project, and at that point then we'll do it. Now, having said that, uh, I'd love to say that we got a great, great access for rail for Central Oahu folks when we open our first segment to, uh, to stadium, but we don't. Uh, and we, we are committed to doing it. But what we do have in Mililani is we have some of the richest transit service, bus service in, Miliwa in Mililani. All day long you can get on that Route 52. Uh, you get it, on, you, it's three stops from the park and ride and then it's express to, uh, to, to Middle Street. In the morning, I think we have six express bus routes in Mililani that go directly into town. We have the Route 51, which is the local bus that goes along Kamehameha Highway. Uh, and so, uh, you, you know, the, we are going to make it uh, uh, a very convenient access uh, with our transit ramp that we are going to build. Uh, not sure of the time frame, but I know Lori's got it programmed in, in her project. She's building it, uh, and it's, it's going to happen. And then you're looking really at about a five-minute ride to, uh, to Pearl Highland. So bear with us. Uh, we are not going to, uh, uh, you know, abandon Central Oahu, and we'll figure out the parking side, too. We're committed to both the parking and the transit access. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you. I want to record the fact that second, it's an hour and 40 minutes before the first conversation on <laughs> the racetrack has come up. Hey, Go you ahead. remember me, Mr. Mayor? I remember you. And you said you could get it done in two years. So let me ask you, how many acres do you need? Because somebody last week whispered in our ear, 25 acres. 25, we, 25 acres is not going to do it. Okay, how, much, how many acres? We need close to 200 acres. Woo. What, what we plan on building is not a racetrack. We're planning on building a complex for a, a number of different race venues. So we're just looking at that as a ballpark figure. Maybe not that much, but 22 acres. I heard that just heard 25 that 25 acres, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's 25 acres is not even enough to do a quarter mile or one eight mile. Okay. But um, the reason why um, I have some questions is because... Uh, some of the races are confused tonight because they kind of took off work to come here to the town hall meeting and um, they found out that a meeting was done in a parking lot. So No, I, I, I walked in to come here to meet with the volleyball yeah, yeah. team and, and you our guys Lee said, took off. you have to come over here I, they, now and I they, did. It wasn't a meeting. I was out there for like two minutes. Yeah, so what I wanted to um, ask a question is, you know, what was talked about in a parking lot. And well, was, I know well, Mike, uh, you and Mike were supposed to sit down. We did. About, um, we about did. what was going on with the land thing. We, in the, we did. We sat down, as I promised last week. This yeah. past week, I already mentioned, alluded to it earlier. Mm -hmm. We met with the senior Navy officials, including okay. Admiral Aguilino, and we asked him, we talked about it, but I think we misrepresented you guys because we talked about 25 acres, which they said that they would consider. Okay, mm -hmm. but they maybe want to consist of us because we're going to have the opportunity again this week up at Indo Paycom and tell them, Admiral, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong information. Oh, okay. We probably need m more like a minimum of 100, okay? All right? So we hear, look, I'm on record of saying it. I, if we could get something like that built, it's great. I think anything and everything we can do to provide recreational opportunities for our families, to add to the joy of living, mm -hmm. that enhances everything, I'm, I'm not, we're not against that. Well, that's, that's the thing with why people, you know, you talk about 
cost of living in Hawaii is expensive. Housing right. is expensive, so people move away for that, for that fact. They also move away because there's no recreation for the kids. Yeah. All the schools, the auto shops all shut down. Um, racing uh, machine shops shut down. There's only two left, and they're struggling right now. The racing community kind of died. And we and, don't want it to die. And they're moving away. They move into Vegas. They move into California because really? everything is there. But they want to come back here. You know, I was just talking to some other races, right. and they're willing to move back, but there's, you know, nothing over here. So that's why we're trying to push it. And I applaud you, and I applaud Mike for pushing this thing together. I think we came farthest than anybody else. We will. We're just beginning on this. We're not going to give up on it, okay? I thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you. Aloha, Mayor. Aloha. Aloha, Cabinet members. Thank you very much, Dean Harvest Waihua residents. I'm going to talk about something that's very touchy with the city, money. And the thing is that I'm going to propose to you, simply proposal, how do we make money with these wedding venues that have been stopped, so they're, they're performing their services along our beautiful beaches and parks? Well, you get them lined up to submit an annual fee based upon either 10, 15, 20 percent of their gross revenues. Then you permit them, not all, but some at this park, some at that beach, and go on and go so forth. This is going to bring in revenues to the city, and it's going to bring in big revenues to the city. Now, the next thing, pay raises. I am a government employee for 43 years, and any pay raise I get, I appreciate. You are in a thankless job. You, right there. It's thankless. People expect the biggest, wholehearted, 200%. Hi, Laurie. <laughs> Laurie and I used to work together. Mike and I used to work together. So I commend you folks. Hi, Ernie. <laughs> but please, please, you know, once we get some more revenues in, you're more than happy to take a huge pay raise. I, would, I wish I was there still at the city, but I'm not. But uh, thank you very much for listening, it. and take that suggestion, please, to heart. Yep. Uh, well, one of the things I can tell you is that the wedding business in a post-COVID environment came back very strong. It's, it happens to be uh, a group that I've had a lot of conversations with because of what's happened with respect to the beaches and whatever. And we're now in, you know, before council. It's going to take quite a while. It's trying to look at getting an island-wide system as opposed to having some beaches where it's banned on the commercial activity. We want to do it more equitably. It's a controversial subject because, um, but we said that even when we signed the bill. I, I, banned, I banned commercial activity in Wyman L, it's, and everybody was happy about it, but I said at the time we did it that we were going to look for something more equitable. Uh, the wedding business is a big piece of business, and I can tell you as entrepreneurs, if you will, we do look all the time for revenue-making opportunities, and I appreciate your comments. Ma'am. Good evening, Mayor Bangiardi and other city officials. My name is Catherine Kupuka'a, and I was late in coming to the meeting, so I don't know whether my question was posed or not. But it's in regards to the um, individuals who have a gun carrying permit, and there are, um, I guess, places where they are not allowed to carry their gun. Whereas in other states, um, the community is crying out for um, personnel, uh, like a, a, a police or um, military to uh, be in the school facilities. And so I was wondering um, if the state of Hawaii, um, their thinking is the crime is very low in this community where somebody would come in and um, shoot their uh, guns off. So what is your, what is your question? Um, you are, um, or the city council is, um, not allowing the gun carrying permits to be go into the near To go anywhere they want to go? Uh, like, yes. Let me address that because um, when the Supreme Court 
upheld the ruling and, and, and announced that open carry uh, would be allowed as a Second Amendment right. It also said within that context that the counties themselves, cities and counties, could determine where they felt people could, with those permits, take those weapons. So the first rule of thumb is that we're going to uphold the Supreme Court ruling, and we have a process involved with respect to people applying and being reviewed, and we have given out permits to people. But within the ruling, as I said, we could determine safe spaces or sensitive places, which we did. And I signed that bill into law last Friday, okay? and it's Bill 57. And I will tell you right now that what I've heard from the people in support of that bill is a Hawaii that hasn't existed, that I don't know, and not one that we want to be party to creating. So I would be hard pressed for anybody in this day and age where each and every day it seems we hear about a different mass shooting. We've had low gun violence here. This is our culture. We haven't been a gun culture for 170 years. I have yet to hear an argument that says why I can take my gun to church, to a restaurant, you know, to a hospital, to a government building, and so on and so forth. So we listed 13 places. We worked very diligently to do that. We've signed it into law. And we've had an overwhelming support in that. And we didn't do that in a vacuum. We reached out. We talked to everybody. We talked to the hospitals. We talked to the retailers. We talked to the hoteliers. We obviously is in government. And we have obviously worked with our police department. So just so you know, we're trying to keep people safe. And... Um, and this is a world right now where we have more guns than people. And we're not saying if you want to have a gun to protect yourself and you're qualified and you know how to carry it and you want to keep it at home because you think you want to protect your family in that circumstance, nobody's saying you can't do that. But I'm not going to allow people to be walking in on my watch and taking it to parks and other places where there's no need for it. So that's where we come down. Can I ask another question? It's regard to um, the rail. Yeah. Um, do you have a ballpark figure on the ridership? Projected ridership first yes. year? Roger. When we complete the system, we expect, uh, we're projecting right now to Civic Center, uh, approximately 85,000 riders. Uh, when we complete the system to Ala Moana, that number will be in excess of 100,000 per day. What about the... Uh, First segment from Kapolei to the stadium. Yeah, for that, I think we, you know, uh, we're projecting and I'm hoping for about 10,000 people per day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Were you at our meeting last week? No. Okay. Well, it depends on what I ask, I guess. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Aloha, Mayor, and thank you for being here and, and uh, for all the representatives for being here. My name is Dennis. I'm a pastor here in the community. And I just want to start off by saying, you know, when you came into office, uh, you, you were very careful to make sure that churches and houses of worship could remain open. And I appreciate the compassion that you showed then and, and then the way that you've answered a lot of the questions tonight and just showing continued compassion. And, and uh, you know, as a pastor, the spiritual health of our community is very important to me. But in, in addition to being a pastor, I'm a dad. And, you know, the emotional and social, physical and mental health of my son and, and kids his age are obviously very important to us and you've already heard from the hockey community you've heard from the the roller uh, derby you know as we saw in 2016 there were certain uh, certain uh, playing surfaces that were resurfaced in Mililani, basketball um, courts, tennis courts, things like that. Uh, looking at the hockey community and the, the hockey rink that was already mentioned, you know, the, the, the science is very clear on the benefit that sports has in the life of uh, children up through adults. And so whatever we can do to support ongoing opportunities for kids is, is obviously huge for not just me as a dad, but just as a community sure. member. And so I thank you guys for uh, the opportunity you've, you've given us to be able to talk about these things. Uh, my, I guess my question tonight is, you know, as we discuss resurfacing or, or refurbishing the hockey rink, you know, is there, an, is there a timeline for some of these projects to, to try and, you know, move things along and, and, and be able to get these things? I don't uh, think any care. one of us can offer a specific timeline tonight except that um, we're, that's why we're doing these things. And we want to be able to act on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can tell you that um, 
First of all, when I think of Mililani, I think of one of the best planned communities around. You know, and especially with a lot of recreational stuff here. I'm not saying the hockey rink is in the best state. I'm not saying we couldn't use a, a race, racing track or, or uh, everything else that's been talked about tonight. But this is a pretty good community when it comes to sports activities and raising a family. Uh, I can tell you, having spent my 20s as a college football coach, a lot of who I'm, uh, that I'm rooted in, I understand that dynamic. And I'm also a dad that raised three kids here. So I hear you, that's why we're out here. We wanna figure out what we can do with what monies we have, what's a priority, and what we can make happen. And I'll just leave you with this, Pastor. You know, we don't talk about this publicly, but I'll just share it with this group. There are two things, and we, this group of people have tremendous task. They all work on, we have a lot of priorities. We have one that's probably more equal than ever, ever and that's public safety. But on the same token, one of our agendas, and the reason why we're here tonight, is that we know we have to rebuild trust in local city government. We know that. We know that based on city audits and everything else, and we know that the only way to do that is to be not only consistent, but to provide results and action, and to be on point with people. And the other thing that we know in the post-COVID environment, because all of us were impacted beyond anything that we could have imagined, the psychological and the financial damage we're still dealing with and will for some period of time, as a result of that, we're also here, we talk a lot about it, is how do we rebuild hope in our community, okay? And we look for every opportunity to do that. And what you're talking about, and that's why I heard when I heard the, uh, talking about the race tracks, that people are moving, we're very aware of the out-migration over the last five years and how it's gotten accelerated, you know? And that's not necessarily a city thing that we could control per se, but what can we right. do about it is what we're trying to get done. So. Believe me, and I say this to a community that really has its act together, um, we understand that responsibility from our, our standpoint, and we're gonna do everything we possibly can. I appreciate that, and I okay. think, you know, just to add to your point, you know, I've lived in a lot of different places as a pastor, and here in Hawaii, we see some of the most pristine and most beautiful recreational areas, I, I think, anywhere. It rivals anywhere in the country, and, and that's a testament to what you guys are doing, so we appreciate you, and any any help that can be given to, to refurbish yeah. or help that? Why don't you just go it? fix the hockey rink, and we'll all be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Let me assign it to you. One okay. step at a time, There sir. you go. All right. Okay. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. It's a thank game you, changer. Thank you. Okay. We've got about uh, 10 minutes, I believe, okay? I know we've got four people here, so guys, go quick. Hi, um, Aloha Mayor. This is actually my first town hall meeting I've ever been to, so kind of bear with me a little bit. It's not too scary, though, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did have a question in regards to, um, like, highways in general. I know that people have said that there are a lot of accidents on these highways. Highways are state, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, but um, I guess... My question is in regards to what happens after a person gets into an accident. Um, when the police arrive on site, the first thing that they have to do is call a tow truck because you know they have to get the car and the road clear. But um, a lot of times when the police call, these tow trucks that come are private contracts with the, um, go the government. And I guess there is supposed to be like a minimum versus maximum amount of charge that they can do. And oftentimes a lot of people get overcharged just based on the condition of the car or okay. so on. Um, so, do I have to cut you off? The question is... The question is, um, is the city and county doing anything in regards to like monitoring their contracts with these private firms? Because um, I guess like I don't need to go over the numbers, but okay. I have been... Sorry. In, sorry. Derek, you want to take a shot at this? We've got somebody that can take it. It's a good question, interesting question. I wasn't really aware of the, how do you know there's a lot of overcharging? How do you know? Um, so, I'm kind of a new driver. I've been in an accident or two, and um, uh, Okay, all right, well, you, you answered that question, okay. And your dad didn't like it, I guess, yeah. No. Okay, all right, go ahead. Hi, thank you for your question. Uh, Derek Meischer, Deputy Director for the Department of Customer Services. Our department does have a motor vehicle control section that it, we do have a, uh, a master agreement that um, is a brand new uh, master agreement. It just started in January of this year for a new tow contractor, a vendor, to basically provide services not just for abandoned vehicles, but also there's a component of it that assists HPD um, to remove cars that have been in accidents. I don't have the exact pricing 
uh, for the HPD component of it, but I'm, I'm happy to take your name and number, and then I can get some of those pricing to you. But we did put it out for an open bid uh, because of procurement laws, so you know, they were found to be the most responsive and the, the best uh, offeror as far as their services and their pricing. Uh, but I'm happy to take your, your information and I can get you that information. Thanks, Dark. Look, my advice to you, if you don't worry about overcharging, don't get in another accident, okay? <laughs> All right, good. Okay, let's go. Aloha, Mayor. My name is Danielle Bass. I'm the chair of the Mililani Neighborhood Board. I recognize 25. you. Thank you for coming out tonight. You have thank an you. excellent team, a lot of familiar faces. Mahalo. Thank you. thank you, Danielle. A lot of the issues that were raised tonight are very much in alignment with the issues that come to the Neighborhood Board, especially the... Pearl Highlands Park and Ride. Uh, but the one issue that got away so far is crime. Uh, this year alone, we've seen three high crime activities in the Mililani community. In January, an elderly woman was burglarized. In February, we had this Mililani Walmart incident in the parking lot. And in March, right. we had this terrible tragedy, tragedy here on this campus. So it's been an ongoing issue, a very a percolating issue in Mililani. We want to see some more policing. We want to see increased policing. And we want to see how we can actually work on this sub-district between the North Shore and Mililani so that we can have more police presence instead of having our police officers go to Wahiwa or North Shore when they're shorthanded. So yeah. what can the city do to increase policing in the Milani community? Well, you know, we have a, and I, maybe I could get some help from one of the HPD guys, but uh, Chief, if you want to do it. But, you know, right now, Danielle, we are short 360 police officers. I'm and just this week, we met again with Chief and, and Keith Orikawa. Chief Orikawa was in the room as well about anything and everything we can do to recruit uh, police officers from, you know, signing bonuses to whatever, um, and just the outgoing recruiting efforts. But being short 360 police officers does manifest itself in a way where they can't be everywhere. We are really stretched, and we just recently agreed to do something that we've never done before with the three 12-hour shifts because I think they can expand the coverage. I'll let Chief Horikawa address that, but as I said to the pastor who's up here, mm -hmm. for all the projects we're doing across the board, pushing all these rocks up the hill at the same time, if there's one that's more equal, more important, overall, it's public safety, and we know that, okay? So. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, thank you for your question. Um, again, totally acknowledge the issues with, with manpower. That's our number one, um, Priority we're not right now is to, to increase that. It's not a simple fix. You know, we're we're in the process of shaping conditions to better improve that. So we have a, a bunch of uh, long-term you know um, efforts to to attract more uh, applicants, and we're even looking at bonuses, so forth. You know, got it. So that, that's the issue. Another more pressing issue is, is is the conditions now, which which you uh, alluded to. Um, again, you know, I'm, I'm a Milani resident. Walmart is literally like a 30-second drive from my house. So I, I I was shocked too as well from that. Um, but, you know, given our shortages, I mean, our, our priority really is to staff patrol. So we'll, we'll never have an issue where, you know, I mean, our patrol officers are, are tremendously understaffed. I mean, we um, maintain a minimum here of 75% of, 70, of our staffing, which is not, not the best, but given the conditions, that, that's what we do. But, you know, we do, we do focus, um, you know, extensively on, on our crime rates. Uh, I can tell you uh, right now is that our, our crime rate, uh, overall, um, in, in on the island, is is down, you know, and it's been down um, for the last several months, uh, trending downwards in um, violent crimes, property crimes. Of course, you know, you're going to have your big aberrations, those big high-profile cases. Unfortunately, um, the Walmart one that was, unfor uh, of course, unfortunate, unpredictable. It was, it was a ran you know, it w it was in a, a, a an act that that's pertinent to Minnesota. You know, it's just. Not to get into any kind of legal um, explanation, but we, we assume that there's some mental issues with, with the suspect involved. Hard to, hard to predict, hard to stop that, that, those kind of crimes. Um, but again, our focus is on reduction uh, in this district, which includes, you know, uh, Milani, Wahewa, North Shore. Um, they're down in all, all categories except uh, some of your car break-ins. So that, that is, you know, kind of kind of um, been, been a problem here. But, you know, to uh, District 2's credit, um, they're, they're on top of it. I mean, they're working issues. Um, even with this, this spike in the, uh, the car break-ins, I mean, they're going to they're focus on that as well. But so when we do, um, we do focus extensively on, on reducing crime here. 
You know, Danielle, I know in some of the rural areas, because I've gone out and done some community walks out in Nanakuli and a few other places where the community is starting to do their own thing. And, and I, HPD supports that. I'm not talking about a vigilante thing, but they're telling people that's not gonna happen here. And we probably, in, in the wake of, because it's gonna take a while to fix this problem. I mean, candidly, if I can say it on behalf of the police department, that's a tough job. And f fewer and fewer people wanna be cops, yeah. okay? And that's just become a reality, not just here, but nationally and all the other bad publicity. So we're doing everything we can. Mahalo for right. your service. You're welcome, Thank Danielle. You You're welcome. We have time. last two questions. Fair? Last two questions. We may go a couple of minutes over, unless you ask really fast and make it really simple, but go ahead. You waited a long time. I'll do my very best. Hi, okay. my name is Kate Ozawa. I'm a member of the neighborhood board here in Mililani, as is my younger brother. Um, Hi, I'm actually here to ask a question on behalf of him because he cannot be here today. Um, he would like to know what plans are in place right now to expand bicycle facilities like lanes, paths, and routes across the county. Matt, you want to talk about that, expanding bicycle paths? Who's, who's best to do that? Roger. Boy, this, you had a hot number tonight, Roger. <laughs> okay, bicycles uh, are one of my personal objectives to really try to do it. We have a great bike plan. Right now in Wailua, we are constructing the Goodall Avenue. We asked for money right next door to, uh, to have a Haleiwa uh, Road uh, bike path that will go uh, fr from... Uh, Wailua Beach Road to uh, to Ali'i Park. Uh, my vision would be that we that on the South Shore uh, we have money to plan a 32 mile bike path that goes all the way from Nanakuli to University of Hawaii. Uh, we're doing that. Uh, we, a lot of that already exists. So what we would be doing would be rehabilitating and in filling in the links that are not there already. Uh, we're going to do that in cooperation with the state of Hawaii, which owns about half of the corridor in that, and they, they're, they're in with us on that program. So we're, we're going to try, we have a lot of new federal money. Uh, I'm going to try to program it in a, an efficient and a wise way, but one of the priorities that we're going to use for that money is to improve our bicycle networks island-wide. Thank, Thank you, you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Ho I hope your little brother will be happy with that answer. All right, sir, you know, last Amen. question tonight, a lot of pressure. <laughs> Aloha, Mayor, and uh, your cabinets, I mean, really dedicated. Who will be sitting here, like, this time? But now, my name is Joe, Joe Chang, and I'm sitting on the board of directors for uh, 96 homes, you know, of 22 buildings, your typical townhouse in Mililani. And uh, I got a question for DPP. Okay. Now, this is not for Monster House, but this is just for our fence replacement. So have the city ever considered like, you know, fast track the repair and maintenance? Because we have to spend like $5,000 on just getting permits for like 22 buildings. Sure. And yep. the number is like 2022-02. So it's like last year, February. Mm -hmm. And I've been dealing with our contractor and trying to get our fence fixed. It's just like falling apart. So okay. we put down like a substantial amount of money, down payment. But I don't know whether the contractor's lying or using this as an excuse, but I did a little well, research. Well, the easy thing for us would be to say your contractor's lying, right? But you we're know, not going to do that. He, Doc, he did the we plot talk plans about and, Joe, you, you know. asked a good question because so much of what we're talking about with DPP is how do we let go, expedite, and make certain things happen that shouldn't have to require the fact that perhaps this request is standing behind somebody in line to build, you know, a 400-foot tower, which is how it currently works. So... Let Don take a yeah, shot. Yeah, because only today I yeah. see that stormwater approval, January 2023, but nothing else got approved. But it's a long list over here, so we need your help because the fans are really falling apart. And every month, we pay almost like two, three thousand just homeowners calling to get the gates fixed. Mm -hmm. And this day, fixing a gate is like 1,200, and we have to fix it. And while we're waiting for this repair, so I, I don't know whether, you know, how, how this could be helping, just not us, but everybody else sure. that has like townhouses in the communities. Yeah, this is a great question and, and it's what we're definitely trying to work on in the department to speed up the per permit process. And to look at, if you're looking at fences, like that's a different yeah. type of permit as opposed to, you know, a large scale um, commercial project so we're trying to create different lines we're trying to speed up and be more efficient um, we also want to be more transparent about where your permit is so you can just go online 
and put in your, your TMK right. or address and you can see, oh, maybe it is with my contractor or my architect addressing comments. So that's, that's in the works, that should be coming hopefully in the next six months and then even be more specific as we update our technology and software. Yeah. So we are working on all of, you know, every way, way in which you can get your permit faster and you'll know exactly where it is, um, whether it's with DPP or with another agency, et cetera. But I will take your, um, I can give you my card and I can look at the numbers and let you know where your permit is and if it's well, stuck for some reason. Thank you so reason. much. Yeah, because I look at this, the contractor seems like maybe he got some no. answers that never give to your examiners. Mm -hmm. I mean, I take it or else it's Joe, just you talk, you talk to Don. I'm glad, I'm glad you came. But thank you so question. much. Right, I mean, welcome. you folks are really dedicated. Thank you. Well, thank this you is a real good segue here. to wrap up the evening. So let me just start off by saying if I have any regret tonight, it's that you didn't get a chance to hear from each and every one of these people. And there's only a few of them because I started out the evening telling you how proud I am. They're also extremely competent. But we really want to thank all of you for coming tonight. We're not going to be running out of here. We appreciate this. It means a lot to us. I told you in the beginning, this is a journey of learning for us. I think you've been very informative. You've been a great group and been very polite. I love the fact you all applaud for each other at the end. Thank you for that. Thank you for all you do for this community and being the people who you are. And I promise you, we're going to be responsive to what was talked about tonight. Thank you very much.